Typically, I like to look into the week of Vacation Bible School. Uh, it's not always, well, it's rarely easy to figure out what the Bible theme is by looking at the overarching theme. Uh, I mean, they just give us some good decoration ideas with the overarching theme, and then beyond that, there is a, a theme, a thematic passage that kind of guides the week, and then there are Bible studies each day, and mission studies, and activities, and crafts, all the things that, that are affiliated with the, the general Bible theme. For those of you who haven't been to Bible school in a long time, or who haven't had the opportunity to work in vacation Bible school in a long time, you would need to know that this Bible school is radically different from the Bible school of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, those of you who worked back in the day will remember that uh, back in that day, the, the kids came to you in the morning and you stayed with them all blessed day long. You taught them everything. You, you did the music, you did the crafts, you did the Bible study, you did everything until it was time for the little darlings to go home and then you sent them home. Well, it's a more center style of learning today and, and so the kids rotate to all the different centers. And so we've got folks who are prepared to do the Bible lesson. We've got folks who are prepared to do the mission study. Back here in the, in the choir room, they're set up to do the crafts that, that go along with the, the study each day. And, and so the kids are constantly moving. And some of our folks that work in Bible school are guides. I mean, that's their role to get the kids from point A to point B with the hope of not losing any along the way. And we're pretty good. We got about a 95% success rate. Uh, and those 5%, they show up eventually, sometime during the week, and we get them back to their moms and dads. But it's, it's a really uh, good plan, and it works exceptionally well. And it doesn't seem to wear any one person out uh, too terribly bad through the course of the week. So the passage of Scripture, as I was beginning to dig around in this, this week's Vacation Bible School, the, the theme passage is this passage that should be, I hope it is for you, a very familiar passage of Scripture. And I want to take a few minutes tonight just to talk about uh, what, what the kids are going to be getting and what I want you to understand about what they're going to be experiencing throughout the course of the week. Paul came to that 12th chapter of Romans, those first two verses, and, and in those two verses he lays out a possibility that exists between two very clear, two delineated choices for all of us. And, and my prayer is, and, and obviously this is a word that is pointed primarily to those who are believers. It's an encouragement to those who have come to faith in Christ to not necessarily take the next step. Because I think we are, we're not clear if we communicate the idea that as long as you pray a prayer or walk an aisle and get baptized, you're good to go. If we teach that and preach that, that's heresy. Because that, that gives the idea to a child or, or to any adult that the most important thing is to experience an ecclesiastical transaction. What Paul did, I mean, the first 11 chapters, he lays such great groundwork, tremendous doctrinal groundwork. Then you get to chapter 12, and he begins to talk about the implications of, of who Jesus is for our lives. And he makes it clear, I think, that if a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ, there ought to be a corresponding change in their lives. Salvation, by, again, by its DNA, is not that we are simply checked off a list somewhere, our name written down in a book, and we're, we carry on with our lives. Something fundamentally happens within us that changes who we are with the potential to continue to change us for the rest of our life. Now, that's not automatic, and that's where Paul's going to go in these verses. It's not automatic at all. Our salvation is by grace through faith in Christ. And that's all of God. Nothing we can do about that. All we can do is in faith, with simple childlike faith, accept what He's done. But once we are in Christ, then we are called upon to walk with Him, to live in Christ. Let's read the verse, and then we'll, we'll carry on. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable 
and perfect. There is, there is a choice, a clear choice before us. And, and I, I think that this is so important, particularly, uh, and try to put yourself in some of these kids' position. Some of our kids who come to church with us go home to moms and dads who encourage them to read the Bible, who teach them spiritual truths in the context of life every day, have conversations about who God is and what He's doing in our life, and praise the Lord for that. Oh, that all of our children were blessed like that. But y'all, there are a number of our children who come to our church, youth who come on Wednesday night, kids who come to Sunday school on Sunday morning, who come to Awana on Wednesday night, who do not have an adult in their life who is a spiritual encourager or equipper. And so we, we, we say clearly, and Richard, have, I've heard him say this over and over, we never pretend to take the place of parents in the spiritual development of children. That's not our job. I mean, back in the day, and let's go back again to those days I was talking about earlier in the 60s and 70s when the, the youth ministry movement really got rolling, we erroneously suggested to parents, just bring your kids and give them to us and we will take care of their spiritual development. That's heresy as well because it's not the job of the church to take the place of the parents. We are partners. But what if you got a bad partner? What if you got a parent out there who is not encouraging, who's not equipping, then we still want a partner. Now, we may have to step, and take, step in and take a more substantial role, but we want to be a partner with those kids. And that's where you come in. Uh, you teachers and you adults roaming around the halls of First Baptist Church, you have an opportunity to be an encourager and equipper to those kids. Particularly if you're teaching them in Sunday school or Awana, you can make a world of difference by being that, that influencer in their life. But we want them to understand as they are coming to know Christ and they're beginning to walk with the Lord to be established, to use the Bible word, there is a clear choice before us. And, and although we have been saved, be care, let me be careful with this statement. Although we have been saved, the process of sanctification, of, of setting our lives apart for Christ does not happen automatically. It is a choice. It's an act of our will. And so Paul called on believers, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, if I'm going to choose, if I'm going to make that decision to follow after Christ, I need to know, we need to know that this commitment is motivated. And Paul made it very clear. I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, this is not something that is forced upon us. This is not something that ought to be drudgery. This is not something that, that ought to be manipulated out of us. This ought to be a response to the mercies of God. It ought to be clear to us that, that God is not trying to take advantage of us, that, that His religion is not trying to abuse us. The most loving thing that we've ever experienced is God's grace through Jesus Christ. And the most loving thing that we can continue to experience is to walk with the Lord day in and day out because He is a merciful God. He wants what's best for us, and He is patient, He is understanding, He is merciful toward us. He interjected Himself into our history, making a way for us to be rescued from our sinfulness, acting out of mercy. Now, to present your bodies. The call to commitment is a call to present every part of our being to God. There's not a part of you that doesn't belong to the Lord. You cannot compartmentalize yourself. Your brain, your mind, it belongs to the Lord. Your body. The old Gnostic thought was that as long as you had it up here, as long as you got the facts straight, it didn't matter what you did with your body, which a lot of Baptists love. Because that allows them to come to church on Sunday morning if they study their Sunday school lesson and go to the bar on Saturday night and get liquored up. And they saw no, no connection between the two. I, I, as long as I got this right, I understand the facts right, then I can live any way I want to live. And Paul wanted to make it abundantly clear. Your mind belongs to Christ. Your body belongs to Christ. Your spirit, your soul belongs to Christ. Because you can't dissect those three. You can't pull them out and effectively compartmentalize them. They all blend together. Miraculously, we've come to understand that if you get liquored up on Saturday night, it's going to affect your worship on Sunday morning. Amen? Ooh, some of you were too quick and too strong with that. Amen. 
as we grow in our understanding of who we are and grow in our understanding of who God is, we ought to grow in our commitment to Him. I was sitting there as I was writing these notes, and I remember very clearly, I was seven, and I had the blessing of growing up in a Christian home, and we were there all the time. That sounds virtuous and noble. But in 1960, early 67, our entire life revolved around the church. Our religious life, obviously, we were there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and any other time they had a church program. But our social life revolved around the church. Every friend that my mom and dad had were connected to the church. And that meant that, that during the week when we weren't at church, we were with church people. Whether they were playing Rook or Wahoo. Which we had to do secretly because my grandfather thought that both cards and dice would send you to hell if you played with them. So mom and dad had to secretly play Rook and, and Wahoo. And, and when we would ask, can we take the Wahoo board to Mamma and Papa? No, no, they always had a good reason it wasn't until later on I realized that for Papa Davis, that would have been bringing hell to his house. And he didn't want any of that. But anyway, our whole life revolved around church. And I'll tell you, the Holy Spirit was very much involved. I realized I was as lost as I could be. And Brother Henry Mott, my pastor, had preached effectively the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my mom and dad had reinforced that at home. And I knew I needed Jesus. And I prayed a simple prayer of childlike faith to receive the gift that God had prepared for me through Jesus Christ. But I will tell you what, I didn't understand a whole lot about Jesus at seven years of age. But I gave as much of myself as I could to as much of Jesus as I understood at that moment. And he saved me. But I will tell you what, he's got a lot more of me today because I understand a lot more about Him. And the more we come to know about Him through His revelation, through His living Word, the more we should give ourselves completely, unreservedly, in faith to Him. Our commitment is to please God because it's what He desires and expects from us. God will never be satisfied with that simple ecclesiastical transaction where, where we have our fire insurance effectively and, and we're good. We're going to go to heaven when we die, we say. But as far as that relationship affecting who we are and how we live day in and day out, not so much. That's not God's plan or desire. He wants all of us and, and He wants that, that relationship to be pleasing to Him. Our commitment is, and he uses this word that, that's a little bit puzzling, but it's not that puzzling. Our commitment is logical or reasonable. It is our spiritual service of worship, is what the New American Standard translation says. Some of your translations will say it is your, it is your uh, logical response, your logical service of worship. It is what makes sense based on our salvation experience by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Again, God doesn't force himself on anybody. And, and we're not going to do that. We're not going to manipulate children. I uh, would never manipulate youth. And, and I would try not to manipulate you. It can be done. I've told you, you, you know it. Many of you were there in the stadium when the evangelist preached here in Mount Pleasant. And it was in some respects a great meeting. And those who got saved during that meeting, I, I believe they, I pray that they were genuinely saved. I was sitting on the platform I was expected to do that as one of the preacher types who was a part of the planning and promotion of this great crusade. I was on the platform listening to this brother preach. And I'm telling you, that brother dangled us all out over hell. I mean, he was, he was singeing our pin feathers every single night. And he, then he got to that part of his message where he said, if you have, or if you have, or if you haven't, or if you haven't, you probably aren't saved. I'm telling you, three nights in, I was questioning whether or not I was saved based on his criteria. I thought if I took him at face value and I believed everything he said about what he's preaching about salvation, I would need to get saved. I didn't. Because I already was.
We don't manipulate. We share truth. Paul wrote truth and trusted the power of the Holy Spirit to call individuals to faith in Jesus Christ and then to call individuals to walk with Christ. The choice is there, clear choice offered to us. And then in that next verse, in verse 2, he gives two very clear directives. The first, he talks about conformity, the path of least resistance. The first command in that second verse is, expre is expressed negatively, and do not be conformed to this world. Because the prince of this world, our spiritual enemy, has a plan, and he has schemes to accomplish that plan. His sole purpose is to thwart the purposes of God. In the life of the unbeliever, he is working to keep them from Christ. He'll do everything he can to keep the lost man, woman, boy, or girl from faith in Jesus Christ. One of the best things he can do is keep them away from church. Because he knows in church they're going to hear the gospel, and he knows if they hear the gospel, the Spirit's going to draw them, and he knows there's a better than average chance they may get saved. If he can keep that person from church, if he can keep that person from the truth of the gospel, there is a much better than average chance that he's going to keep them from salvation. So he works in the life of the unbeliever to keep us from Christ, but he works in the life of the believer to keep us from God's will. Wanting to rob us of the joy of our salvation, the peace that passes all understanding, and the security of our relationship with Jesus Christ. His schemes utilize our base desires as he lures us away from God's purposes by exploiting our basic desires. John described those as belonging to three categories in 1 John chapter 2. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The pressure to conform is pressure from the outside in. The last time I preached this passage, I used this illustration. And the week after I preached it and used this illustration, this ended up on my desk. I've talked about a Play-Doh fun factory for years and years and years. But I have my very own Play-Doh Fun Factory. And in the Play-Doh Fun Factory, there are two cans of Play-Doh. There is the little device that exerts pressure on the balls of Play-Doh as you put them in the hopper. And then down in front, there are two sliding patterns that you put in place. And when you exert pressure on that ball of Play-Doh, it's going to extrude out those patterns and be spit out in the pattern that you have chosen for your Play-Doh. And so you've got, you've got four little squares coming out together. You've got a star shape. You've got a, a circle. You've got three circles. You've got about seven or eight choices. But you pick. You decide what you want the outcome to be. And then the pressure exerted and what comes out is what you have chosen. I don't want to give Satan more credit than he deserves. But I will tell you this, he's picking the pattern. He's picking the pattern. And, and the pattern that he's picking is oftentimes based on what appeals to us. The lust of our flesh, the lust of our eyes, and the pride of life. The things that, that appeal to us, that pull us away from faithfulness to the Lord. They're not necessarily bad things. And not bad things at all. There are some really good things that that you folk, that we invest in, things that we buy, things that, that we want to enjoy, things that we invest in that are not bad, that we can't for one moment say they're evil. But the moment those things begin to take our time and energy and our attention away from the Lord, at that point it's become something less than good. And that thing becomes a pattern. The pressure is exerted. You say, now, Clint, I thought you said we were free will characters. Well, we are. Nobody's carrying us kicking and screaming. Nobody is holding our arms behind our backs and twisting them so that we don't have any choice. We choose. We willfully choose. But we give ourselves over to that pattern and allow ourselves to be shaped and molded by that. It's troubling to me. When I look, and I tell you, you, you know this, I, I send birthday cards to everybody on your birthday, uh, and I think about you and I pray for you. But it is troubling to me as I go through that list of ever how many it is in a year's time, and I come across names of people that at one time were very faithful to the Lord, not just in church, 
faithful to the Lord in their life, but also faithful in worship and faithful in service. And I haven't seen them here in months. Now, I'm not talking about people who never were engaged, never were involved. I'm talking about people who were very, very involved. I'm talking about people who taught Sunday school, people who are involved in vacation Bible school like this coming week. I'm talking about people who've served in ministries, people who were engaged in work in serving the Lord and now have ghosted the church, and I fear ghosted the Lord. And I don't know. There's not a universal remedy for that. But I'm telling you what has happened, I think, in a vast majority of those cases is they bought into something, they invested in something that pulled them away from their relationship with the Lord, and that something has shaped their life more than their walk with the Lord. Don't be conformed to the ways of the world. And I know some of you were wanting me to open this up and demonstrate, but I can't, because if, if you leave it sealed with the original tape, it's going to be worth millions of dollars one day when I'm old and I, and I hand it off to my kids. But point number three, here's the great news. Transformation, as opposed to con conformity, transformation is the way of life, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Transformation. I guess we could say, I was transformed. In the same way that we could say, I was saved, I could say, and said to you a minute ago, I was saved when I was seven years of age. But I have been being saved every day since I got saved. I was transformed from somebody who was lost to somebody who was saved. From somebody who didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ into somebody who had a relationship with Jesus Christ. But... I have been being transformed every day since that process began, and it is a process. And my hope for you and for me, and I'm, I'm, I know that primarily you are an older crowd here tonight. If your true colors were showing, most of you would be gray. Only your hairdresser knows for sure. My hope would be that for every single one of us in this room, you are going to still being, be being transformed to the day you die. Things change. Our health, our physical abilities, even our mental capacities, they change the further we go in life. But my hope, because God knows where we are, He knows what we got to work with, my hope would be that, that God is getting what we have surrendered to Him day in and day out all the way to the end of the road. And I'd hope we'd be able to stand before Him and say gladly, I was being transformed all the way to the end of the road. Be transformed how? By the renewing of your mind. And so, so there it is. Paul has pointed us back to the fact that this process is not one that we uh, create ourselves, that, that we manufacture. This process is as a result of our spending time with the Lord in His living Word. Again, we talk about this as being living and active. And, and it is. It is, not a, it is not a static word. It's not a textbook that we study so we can pass the test. It's the living Word of God in which He reveals Himself to us. So we read the living Word, let the living Word of God get into us, trust the Holy Spirit then to do what the Holy Spirit alone is able to do, and our minds are changed, renewed by the power of God's living Word in the presence of His Holy Spirit, by the renewing of your mind. And the wonderful thing is that as Satan dumps garbage in, the Word has the power to flush out Satan's garbage. Spend some time in the Word. Don't spend all your time on Facebook. If you're spending more time on Facebook than you are in the Word, then you're going to have more garbage than you have life and light. You've got to have a more powerful influence to flush out the garbage of the world. And so that, that's the power of God's Word. Spend time in the Word. Ruminate on it. Think on His Word. Worship in His Word. I mean, if you, if you can hum, sing the songs that we sing on Sunday, the ones that you love, you ought to be singing the Word as well, letting it course through your mind and let your, let your mind be renewed by that process. Transformation is not imposed from the outside in. It is exposed from the inside out. It is guided by the Word of God. It is empowered by the Spirit of God. 
but constrained by the will of God. Because God is never going to lead us to anything that is contrary to His Word, first of all. He's never going to prompt us to do anything that's going to embarrass Him. Isn't that good news? You know, if, if, if you tell me you do something stupid and then you blame God after you embarrassed yourself and you embarrassed your church. I'm going to tell you, no, He didn't. Because God is never going to prompt you to embarrass Him nor yourself. He's going to prompt you to honor Him. Constrained by the will of God. So that our transformed, life, transformed lives are then, according to Paul's word, we are able to prove what the will of God is, demonstrate what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You choose to be a walking, living demonstration of what God can do as we make ourselves available to Him. That's what we're going to be teaching kids this week. But it sure would be good if the adults got it along with the kids. Pray with me. Father, we've sung about it. We've read about it. Now we've talked about it. And I pray, Father, that you will continue to draw us to yourself, transforming us, changing us a little bit more, drawing us a little closer to you. Yeah, flushing out those thoughts and ideas that Satan wants to pour into our heads and let them germinate there, but flushing those out and letting our hearts and minds be guided by your truth and your life and your light. We give this invitation to you available to you, Father, wanting you to speak to us and prompt us. We ask for that in Jesus' name.